Okay, 12.6 is on what's called tessellations. Now, this is a new word for you. It's even kind of fun to say. And um, there's a verb based on it and everything else. And we are going to use reflections, translations, and rotations to make repeat patterns of figures that will tessellate. We can also use glide reflections as well. Probably should have put that in. And we'll identify symmetries and tessellations using our knowledge of basic shapes and their properties. Um, so basically what that means is saying um, when we have tessellations and, and such or or if we have basic shapes, can they tessellate, or, or can we create shapes out of them, or whatever. Now, this is kind of an example of a tessellation, not really. This is one of those, um, probably things by M.C. Escher or somebody else, turning a bird into a fish. But you'll see patterns in them, and that's really what a tessellation is. Tessellation, or otherwise known as tiling, maybe, if you think of a floor tiling and such, it's a repeating pattern of figures that completely covers an area without gaps or overlaps. So if you think of your floor, and if there's a pattern on your floor, then you can look at and say, well, obviously there aren't any gaps because otherwise you'd be, you know, there'd be holes in your floor. Um, so is there a repeating pattern? And if so, what is it? If, if you can determine what that is, then you have what's called a tessellation. If it's completely random, then obviously it's not a tessellation. It needs to be one certain um, piece. You know, think of it like a puzzle where every piece is the same or it's a pattern of the same pieces. Because you, because you know in a puzzle every shape is unique, if not, the pieces might connect differently. And obviously you wouldn't want that, especially when you're doing like the sky or something. Um, uh, sh this should be tessellations. Tessellations can be created with reflections, translations, and rotations. And again, you can use glide reflections as well. I, pro I probably should be putting that in there, but um, so, I don't really want to draw anything in here, at least, at least nothing too special, but think of a tessellation as here's a pattern of a grid, like so. This is a tessellation of squares. Assuming these were all the same thing, this is a floor tiling of sorts. Okay, here are examples of real tessellations, and um, I don't know if they're floor tilings or what, but here are some things. I don't know if they're leaves or birds, you know, something like that. There, there's a bird, there's a bird, everywhere's a bird. Um, but this is a tessellation, and you just want to pick the most unique portions of them and individualize it and say what the transformation is that takes place that makes it tessellate. So, for instance, um, all of these are repeating yellow birds facing this way, or whatever you want to call them. All of these are repeating red objects, maybe facing that way. So, those are the only two unique shapes in here. So, I'm going to say, Here's my unique characteristic of my tessellation. There's just one of them. And then how do I transform to make the other ones? Well, I think I'm basically doing a translation. Each individual um, thing just translates down and just translates over by that much, etc. So you just want to say how much it translates by. I translate by down that way, translate by over that way, and the number of units don't really matter. So there's an example of a transformation tessellation. Here's another transformation tessellation. If I, um, if I see these as cubes, or if you just see them as a bunch of uh, parallelograms or rhombuses or whatever they are, you just want to identify the unique components of it. So I'd say, here's a blue and a red and a green and a yellow. And this is a repeating pattern that you keep seeing over and over. And how does it tessellate? You know, and Where does it move to? So the blue, I translate down that much to get to the next blue. The yellow, for instance, I translate that far over to get to the next yellow, and everything else follows suit. So the red goes down the same amount as the blue. The green goes over the same, same amount as the yellow, etc. So the translations here that take place are those kinds of tessellations. Okay, you have to say whether or not a figure will tessellate. So if you have an individual regular polygon, let's say like a square that I used before here, and let me actually draw out a square. Um, Use the formula, which I will write in a second, for the measure of an angle of that regular polygon. So if I want to find the measure of this angle, which we know in a square it's 90 degrees, but let's kind of prove it. If I want to know that, let's say that for any regular n gonal polygon, where n means the number of sides, so if they said like an 18 gonal polygon, that means it's 18 sides. And if it's a regular polygon, if I have an n gonal poly polygon, in this case n will be four for a square. Um, the formula, <coughs> excuse me, the <laughs> formula for determining um, the sum of the interior angles is derived right here. And you might have seen it or used it before. 180 times the number of sides minus two. So if I want to find out the sum of each interior angle here, 
I'll do 180 times 4, number of sides, minus 2, is 180 times 2, whoops, equals 360. And again, you should know that if each angle here is 90 and there are 4 of them, 90 times 4 is 360. So if 90 times 4 is 360, how do I solve, uh, how can I use this 360 and solve for, and solve for 4? I'm sorry, solve for 90. Well, you use 4. You say 360 divided by 4 equals 90. And so I found um, the measure of an angle for that regular polygon. And I did that by dividing by 4, which is the number of sides. So if you want to solve for this A, which I'm going to use that letter, if I want to solve for this A, which is the measure of one interior angle, I drag this formula in, like so. So I'll say 180 times n minus 2. And I'll divide that by the number of sides n to figure out the measure of one angle of that regular polygon. OK, so 90 degrees is the measure of one angle of this regular polygon. If that angle measure, which is a, is a factor of 360, the regular polygon will tessellate. So if I can do 360 divided by 90, and I get an integer out, like 4, like so, then that means the polygon will tessellate. So I have to take the uh, 360, actually 360, not just the sum of this right here, but take 360 and divide it by 90. And if it becomes 4, if it becomes an integer, or whatever it is, then it will tessellate. Let's do examples, like an equilateral triangle here. They're all uh, congruent sides, like so. And there are three sides in this uh, triangle right here. So let's go ahead and use that formula to figure out the angle measure of one of the sides. Three sides, divide by three again. 180 times one is 180. 180 divided by three is 60. So 60 degrees for the measure of one side, like that. Now I take that 60 degrees, and I do 360 divided by 60. If that ends up being an integer, in which case it does, 6, it means, yes, triangles, equilateral triangles, can tessellate. Basically, I can take a single triangle, make repeat patterns of it with rotations, glide reflections, transform, um, translations, any kind of transformation, and I can make some sort of pattern. A regular pentagon, can I use just regular pentagons and have all closed gaps and such? Well, let's see. Let's first start by drawing one. Now, you can try them out later and just draw them for yourself, but if you want to use a mathematical concept, by all means, just start using this and it'll all pan out. So let's find the measure of one individual angle. So 180 times 5 minus 2, 180 times 3 is 540. 540 divided by 5 is 108. So 108 degrees is the measure of one interior angle here in this pentagon. If I divide 360 by 108, will, uh, or basically saying, is 108 factorable? I'm, I'm pretty positive it's not. I can multiply by 3, I'll get 324, and obviously I'm going to get a decimal out. So 3 point something. No, this will not tessellate. So let's go ahead and start doing check marks here. Or let's do a green check for equilateral triangle. That will tessellate. Red X for pentagon. No, it will not. A heptagon, I don't even want to bother drawing that one. I'm not really sure how to make them look good. Let's just start plugging in the formula and say, will this tessellate? Again, number of sides. Heptagon has seven sides. Divide by seven here. And you get 180 times five. Um, that's 900. 900 divided by seven. I don't even want to begin figuring out what that is, but I do know 700 divided by seven is 100. So the remaining 200, if I divide that by seven, is that possible? No, I already know that, that that's not possible. I can't do 200 divided by 7, so I can't do 900 divided by 7. So I already know that this is some decimal. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. Somewhere between, it's, it's somewhere close to 127, uh, 128, something like that. But it's 128 point something, which means it's not factorable. So I go ahead and use this red, and I exit off and say I can't do it. Okay, every triangle and quadrilateral happens to tessellate, even the most scalene of triangles. If I go ahead and use that one there, and that's a terrible example of a triangle. Let me try that again a little better. Actually, let me just use black lines here. If I use this triangle right here, that's not isosceles. It's not right. It's not, it's not equilateral. It's just scalene. I use that, and I go ahead and group all these points right here. I wish I could. Apparently, I can't. There we go. 